Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am Dungeon Master Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, uh, I am going to continue doing my videos covering Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. And today's video is uh, focusing on uh, the player's options, spells, and magic. So this is a preview once again. I'm not going to go into heavy detail uh, with this uh, with this really incredible book. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by um, the second edition books in that uh, the way that they're laid out and the art, certainly, and the, the writing level of them. Um, I, I know that a lot of times when people look at second edition and they think about these splat books and, and just how much material came out for second edition. But uh, you have to remember that you know, these are all optional, right? It's it's called player's option for a reason, and the splat books were well, optional as well. Um, and I think that in the in hindsight, you know, because you know, I've often said that, you know, back in the day, you know, 1987, 1988, 1989, you know, um, you know, I was a you know older teenager and and probably around 20, 21 years old at the time. And um, I certainly wouldn't have bought all of these books back then. I didn't have the disposable income, uh, you know, at that time. And, and so I was paying for college out of my own pocket and doing all of that. So um, it just wasn't available to me, um, you know. So in hindsight, looking back, though, um, I can say that uh, it wasn't about the game quality or, you know, truly the amount of stuff coming out for it uh, that was an issue. It was strictly a financial issue. Um, and and so when I look at it now, um, having the wherewithal to actually fill up a collection I never had, you know, in that, in that time frame, um, you know, I'm glad that I have. And uh, it really is eye-opening to see you know, kind of like what I missed out on. Um, and uh, it does encourage me to think of, you know, uh, someday at least, uh, once I get past everything else that I'm doing for the remainder of 2024, um, you know, uh, it, it would be a really good experience, I think, for me to uh, run a, a genuine uh, AD&D second uh, edition campaign um, I'm, I'm just kind of shopping around and looking to see what world setting I would use. Um, you know, I guess I could go with Forgotten Realms. Uh, and uh, I've actually seen a box set on eBay that wasn't incredibly expensive. So um, I could go that route. Um, or I'll just set it in Greyhawk and, and uh, you know, save, you know, the additional money, even though it's not a huge expense. But... Uh, but just don't have to go into learning a whole new campaign setting. But all that being said, without further ado, let's just jump right into uh, full screen first. So here is what I am talking about. And uh, like I said, I mean, you can see the incredible artwork that is on the front. Now, this one um, is written by uh, Richard Baker. And, uh, but the, the, same art and editing and everything. Uh, the editing is by Miranda Horner, uh, creative director, still Steve Winter, cover art by Jeff Easley, obviously. And then the interior art is uh, just probably about eight or ten other individuals. I'm not going to go through them all. But again, I really like the layout aspect of this because of the way that, you know, it's, it's in red. If it's a title, it's... Uh, you know, there's a lot in this book, too. I mean, even for it being like 127 or so pages. Um, oh, no, it's higher than that. Uh, that's just the, the table. Um, so it is, let's see, a total 185, a little bit further. So um, I'm not counting the index. I'm just going through the appendices uh 188 pages 
So 188 pages. So that's a, and that might have been a uniform number too um, that they used across the board. So I do have a PDF for this. And again, um, it does not include the art. And I'm using one of those flip archive spots. So um, here we go. I hope you can see this uh, pretty clearly. I think I can zoom. I can zoom in and make it a little bit larger. But I do want to flip. I'm doing uh, flipping double pages as well. And there's some things here that I, you know, really like. Um, maybe I'll, I'll click it out a little bit. So um, I'm going to skip over the fantasy. Um, you know, what is a fantasy? Uh, what you need to, uh, what you need to use this book. Uh, so there's some typos in this PDF. Um, I wonder if that's an original typo in the book itself. Um, so let's let's take a look. I seriously doubt that. No, so that's not even there. Um, oh no, here it is. What you need to use the book. So yeah, it's weird that they, you know, did such a, a lame typo. Uh, integrating spells. Uh, I am going to back this out because I can't read it uh, to you. Um, what I like about this is that it starts talking about making the switch, right? So adding these these optional spells and 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 other you know uh, schools of magic and uh, the specialty priest and the specialty wizard and making the switch from the core rule books, uh, to this. So how do you integrate this? And, and it talks about adding uh, the role of magic in the campaign. And, and it talks about scarcity, right? So how common is magic in the campaign? Um, we, uh, priests versus uh, wizards. Uh, wizards magic and priest magic are not the same thing. Uh, both forms of magic do not have uh, to be present in the campaign. Um, if you wish, like if you look at Dragonlance, uh, priests did not have magic until the gods were rediscovered, right? So um, magic items could also have a sense of scarcity attached to them as well. Uh, you can make your, your world a low magic uh, or even a no magic place. And, and magic is only just like an illusion or just a misconception of people. Uh, mystery is another aspect, so there could be a mysterious uh, aspect to magic in the world as well, and, and, and there should be some unknowns about magic in the world. Um, then we go to, uh, you know, power, what can magic accomplish in the campaign? Uh, is there anything it can't do and why and so on? So you're going to start you know, thinking about as a dungeon master, uh, not only what role is magic going to play, but how powerful are you going to make magic in the world as well? If you look at worlds like um, like the Hyborian Age, Robert E. Howard's Hyborian Age, magic was very rare, but when it was encountered, it was powerful and dangerous, all right? And so that's how he handled magic in his world setting. Um, the cost of magic, so uh, we're not just talking about the cost of, you know, spell components or, or whatnot, but also the cost of, you know, how does it affect the character in casting it? What are some of the downsides to it and everything? Um, even in Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars, if you want to consider the force of magic that they're, they're kind of harnessing, uh, when, when the Sith are harnessing you know, the dark side of the force, it corrupts their body, it corrupts their facial features, it it actually has a cost of doing that kind of magic. Um, creating a worldview of magic. So here's another aspect of it, you know, and these are going far beyond the, the discussions that were taking place in AD&D first edition when it came to magic, and, uh, and even in second edition as well. So um, this is just giving an opportunity for a dungeon master to really 
think about how he or she is going to incorporate magic in their world and then what are its different roles um, you know and effects of it as well so we have the colleges of sorcerers which I really really like um, you know I, I think that that should be something that is um, you know that is kind of uniform I mean there's We've always had, you know, schools of magic where where people would go to learn magic. But I, I like the idea of having different types of magic, and then there are very specific places that you would go to get that kind of knowledge. Um, let's continue on. So you have secrets, man was not meant to know, so that's like more eldritch magic and, and, and the like. Smoke and mirrors, magic resistance uh, comes into play. Magic and storytelling will go here. Now we go into the chapters of, uh, you know, chapter one, wizards. So we start talking about wizards. Schools of magic, all wizard spells belong to one or more schools of magic. A school of magic represents related spells with common features and characteristics for a mage who is basic or general wizard, the school of a spell doesn't matter too much. He can learn and cast any spell without regard to the spell's school. The only exception to this rule is wild magic, which is completely unfathomable to any wizard except a wild mage. All right, so you start breaking into the different schools, and they're gonna go through these here. So you have the schools of philosophy, all right, and these are uh, abjuration, alteration, conjuration and summoning, um, enchantment and charms, divination. Uh, then you have um, the school of the universe, uh, which comes through divination is uh, the illusion fanta. Uh, I'm sorry, see the use of, sorry, skip. Um, Divination, illusions and phantasms, necromancy, universal magic. And then you can go through creating a new schools, the schools of effect. So the schools of the effect are, you know, oftentimes called like the, the natural magics. So you have air, earth, fire, or elemental magics. Air, earth, fire, water, dimensional magic, force, shadow. Creating a school of effect, you can then look into that. Then you have the school of tomaturgy. So I always have a hard time saying that word. Uh, the school of alchemy, the school of artifice, the school of geometry, and the school of song. All right, which I would guess is like bards, language, uh, or magic, and the school of wild magic. The schools of uh, universal magic, you have um, important note wizards do not automatically know universal spells. They must study and attempt to learn the spells of this school, just like any other spells. However, when a wizard character is first created, he automatically begins play with any one first level, uh, any first level spell, universal spells of his choice in his spell book. Although the count against the character's limit of, uh, uh, they do count against the limit of spells. The school of magic contain uh, consistent, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading terrible this morning. The school of universal magic consists of the following spells. So cantrips, um, comprehend languages, detect magic, hold portal, identify, read magic, wizard mark, knock, protection from cantrips, wizard lock, dispel magic, remove curse, teleport at fifth level, uh, enchant an item, which is sixth level, teleport without error, seventh level, permanency, which is eighth level, and astral spell, which is ninth level. So. I typically, as a dungeon master, say that every magic user, character, wizard, as they call them here, is going to start in their spell book, not one of their choices, it's automatically there, is read magic. 
Um, kind of hard not to have that spell already. Um, so read magic is a definite one that is in there as a default. I would say the same thing for cantrip as well. <coughs> so they would have cantrip or at least some of the cantrips automatically in there. Um, so let's see. I'm just getting a text. Uh, so wizard characters we go through and we talk about the various types of wizard characters and you know their their spell books um you know what does it take so what is a mage what is a specialty wizard so we go into the different types of magic users in general uh specialists in schools of philosophy uh so it's it's a complete catalog of all of the various um, aspects of magic use in the world. And I really, really do enjoy that. I, I think it's a great thing to take a look at. It's something that uh, if you want to add this nuance to your, uh, to your gameplay, to your campaign, uh, I would certainly recommend this. And you can use this. You can see it's not tying anything directly to game mechanics here. It's all philosophy at this point, right? It's, it's all uh, something that you can easily transport these ideas to any other game system you wish. As long as it's a, you know, fantasy, you know, role-playing game, you can apply it there as well. Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time, and I'm just going to uh, try to see what page number I need to jump to. Um, I want to talk about clerics. And, of course, they don't have the table of contents in here. Um, so let's see. Uh, new priest spells. Um, and they get into spell, you know, they get into spell points and stuff. I'm, I'm actually just going to um, switch, switch over to here. So There's things about uh, proficiencies that are in here. Um, uh, priests. So priests is going to be on page 28 of this. And there are the spheres of access for priests, right? So where um, wizards have the schools of magic, priests have uh, specialty schools for themselves. So you have priest characters, which are the clerics, the crusaders, the druids, the monks, and the shaman. Uh, customizing priest characters, uh, optional abilities for them, uh, optional limitations, dealing with game-breaking characters. So they have a notion there on, on that. And then, um, so you can have specialty priests. It, there was something about priests that I always thought that uh, AD&D First Edition did not do um, very well. It should have gone much further. In later editions, they started... Um, adopting the ideas of a priest being more or a cleric being more aligned with his or her deity and they had to um they were aligned to the domains of that deity more so than anything else and um and they, they also would be able to utilize the weapon of choice of the deity you know so you could have uh cleric characters using blade weapons or bows or or whatever they normally in ad and d first edition would have been uh prevented from using all right uh they they could use them there and i have always as a game master said that you're it's not so much your alignment as a priest that you have to follow it's the domains of your deity and you must perform acts instead of just saying, oh, my character is going to pray for his, you know, his or her spells for the next day. No, you have to perform acts within the domain of the deity on a fairly regular basis in order to then regain your spelling, you know, your spell ability, um, which I call favors. You know, I, I adopt that from... Mifrog, uh, because that's what they really are. They're not necessarily magic spells. Uh, what, what they are is uh, they are the favors of the deity coming through 
the uh, the cleric character as like kind of like a conduit of the deity's uh, power, the deity's favor, and um, and so they're required to do those domains, right? So if you have a deity that is light and um, is uh, you know, good, you know, as a, you know, very loose uh, description uh, and, uh, and healing, right? Then in order for a cleric to be able to bring back his spells the next day, you know, those favors the next day, uh, then every day the, uh, the cleric must heal or cast a light spell or, or bring light to, uh, you know, someplace and, and, and obviously then just be genuinely good, uh, in their actions and such. And then the next morning they will have a replenishment of their favors in order to do that. So uh, I think any time that you can take, um, playing options and integrate them into your game, uh, to add that new layer of, uh, of detail for character creation and character development. And, um, you know, and it's something that is not, you know, mechanically, game mechanically complicated, then uh, it really is a win-win. Uh, the players are going to have a better sense of their character and, you know, it's going to help form their character's personality you know, and, uh, and, and allow them to role play them, uh, along those lines as well. And, uh, and it's not a real burden on the dungeon master in order to uh, allow these things and incorporate them into his or her campaign, right? It's, it's a, it's going to allow them to kind of develop ideas, uh, for, you know, um, tasks, for the priests now that will better inform, uh, you know, uh, them on how to stay on the right path as far as the domains of their, their, uh, priest character or cleric character. Uh, so I think it's a really, really good option, uh, to incorporate into your campaign. Uh, so I'd highly recommend it. And, um, you know, I've, I've done videos on like the combat tactics and all of that. And, uh, and, and that's another good book for little pieces here and there, but it's, that was much more impactful on the game mechanics, uh, than this is. So, um, at least that's my, you know, preview and first glance at it and, uh, you know, and then just focusing on a few areas here and there on it. Uh, but I certainly welcome any commentary in the comments section to say, hey, you know what, um, I've tried this, I didn't like it, and this is why, or I tried this, I love it, and I've incorporated it. I'd love to hear comments on either side of this, um, you know, whether you used it or you didn't, uh, whether you liked it or you didn't, and, um, and as always, uh, continue, you know, continue watching. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. Uh, hit the like button, share, and uh, and absolutely comment in there. Um, if anyone follows a YouTube channel that is uh, you know really focused on a D and D second edition, you know, uh, please feel free to just drop the the name of the web you know the channel uh, the YouTube channel uh, in a comment section so I can go check it out. I know there's a couple here and there that I have seen, but um, I would love to someday, uh, soon, perhaps, uh, while I'm doing this coverage of AD&D 2nd Edition, uh, to have somebody come on, you know, come on my channel and we'll talk, you know, it'll be a live stream or, or something along those lines. And uh, I really do want to learn from you and learn about AD&D 2nd Edition and what the draw was for you as well. I, I'm starting as I go through these books, I can start to see what the draw was. And, um, you know, which is not something I had generally before, uh, you know, digging through these books in a little bit more depth than I had. And, um, and there's a lot of people out there where this was their introduction, you know, to Dungeons and Dragons or to role-playing games in general. 
and you know these are people that are you know typically about 10 years younger than me so these are you know these are the people in their 40s let's say that were introduced to this game and so their um you know their input uh onto my channel you know would be really really appreciated because they're they're not quite the next generation of player, but they're certainly the next uh, wave of uh, players that are, that are out there. So those that really started uh, getting into the hobby in 1990 and beyond, as opposed to, you know, those like myself that were, you know, 77, 78, 79, more so 79, uh, and then beyond. Uh, so as always, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen in my comments section or at a convention sometime soon. Uh, ShireCon coming up this, uh, this Friday and Saturday. Really looking forward to it. I am running Shadow Dark and Gangbusters at this, uh, at this convention. So uh, just one session of each and then I'm playing in a bunch uh, as well. So really looking forward to it. And... Um, you all have a great rest of your day and take care.